Hello, I'm Dr. Carrie Bedian at the Fertility Center of Las Vegas, joined by my two splendiferously spectacular <laughs> co-hosts, Dr. Susan Hudson from the Texas Fertility Center. <laughs> I am definitely splendiferous. <laughs> Obviously. And Dr. Abby Eblen from uh, Nashville Fertility Center. How are you ladies doing today? Doing great. Doing Yay. really good. Really good. All right. Splendiferous. I'm splendiferous. <laughs> and we are joined today by Dr. Jenny Brown, who is one of our lovely colleagues. And Jenny, if I try and say your clinic's name, I'm going to confuse it because, and you can, you can see what I just did with Susan and Abby's. I'm like, wait a minute, <laughs> who's Texas fertility and Nashville fertility, as opposed to the fertility center of those places. Yeah. And so I was thinking like, okay, I wrote it down. I got it. I'll be set. And then I realized, no, I don't trust my notes. So tell us what clinic you're from. Sure. Hi, I'm Jenny. Thanks for having me. I am from Vermont, which is a little bit easier than maybe the title of our clinic, but we see patients from all over the Northeast. So our clinic is Northeastern Reproductive Medicine. Ah, there yeah, go. I was not going to get that right, even though I thought I had it written down correctly. Because, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so we are super glad um, for you to join us because we're going to talk all about surrogacy agencies and how to work through all of that, which is a pretty extensive work through. Um, but first, so we are used to having all the spring conversations that are routine and appropriate to Las Vegas, Texas, and Nashville, which are all like, oh, what are you going to do with your garden? And, you know, the yeah. weather's really warming I, up. I imagine it's a little different up in Vermont. It is a little different up in Vermont. Spring in Vermont is magical. We love it up here. It's also mud season, which maybe mud season isn't quite as magical, but it's a crossover. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of mud right now. <laughs> it's a crossover between the end of the ski racing season and the uh, sort of beginning of the sap running. We call it the sap running when the That's sap hilarious. is coming up and out of the out of the trees when the days are warmer. So That's what does a different that mean? Type of like, racing. Yeah, different type of racing. Exactly. So how does sap come out of trees? I don't. I I just see a maple tree in my yard, and I can't imagine sap you, coming like, out. Like screw of... the little thing in the tree, right? And then it like you like. Pop you a vein, a, essentially. Like you put a you bucket underneath tree. it, right? You tap the tree, and you can put a bucket underneath it, or you can have tubing and sort of have a bigger system if you're really trying to get a lot from a lot of trees. But so keeping it simple, was, Abby. Have you ever seen Hunger Games? No. Oh, <laughs> darn. So, is are these maple trees that you're like putting the tap? Yes, in? sugar maples, maple trees. And I am sugar. probably the raw. I am not your expert on this. My husband is a maple syrup farmer, and he's the expert. So if I say anything, he'll, he'll, he might chuckle at how I describe it, but we all love to eat syrup up here. So we all know a little bit. <laughs> so what's special about Vermont? Like I'm sitting there thinking, well, I have maple trees. Why can't I make, does it have to be a specific kind of tree in a specific kind of environment? I'm guessing. You know, it's interesting because several States can make a little bit of maple syrup, but it's really the weather. It has to, you have to yeah. have a long period of time where it's freezing in the night Okay. And then above freezing in the day and that warm mm. sun really gets the oh, sap running. Okay. Oh, wow. That is it's so pressure cool. Pressure change. There, yeah. So what wow. are some more unusual things you use maple syrup on that the rest of us may not usually do? I think the best use is to get your kids to eat vegetables. You oh, mix yeah. up like a baggie of cauliflower or broccoli just with a, you know, even just a teaspoon or two and then wow. put it in the yeah. oven and then they'll eat any vegetable. Salad dressing, salad dressing is amazing with like balsamic, olive oil, maple syrup, mustard. Mm, That's a good one. Um, really yeah, good. we put it in coffee on ice cream. Coffee? Oh, wow. I'm Every craving maple syrup now. <laughs> maple syrup you know and coffee. That, yeah, the waiting room pre-COVID, we haven't reinstated this post-COVID, but pre-COVID the NRM waiting room uh, had maple syrup right next to the coffee. So everyone could just put a little in because everyone up here is used to having that sweetener. So funny. Interesting. That's Antioxidant interesting. rich too, right? So it's probably good for everything. So you said the other thing that you guys do right now is ski racing season. So why are the end of ski racing season, you said? Do you still have snow right yes. now? Yes. We do. We have a lot of snow. So I spent the day at Killington Mountain Resort ski racing with my kids. I was not personally ski racing. They were okay. all racing. Can I just wow. say Killington and is not sounding like a warm and fuzzy place to spend the afternoon doing anything? <laughs> mm -mm. 
particularly not getting to the top of a mountain on two pieces of stick, two sticks and going down it, thinking that you're going to have any kind of good result with a name like this is coming from our desert rat here. (laughs) Yeah. Listen, the first and only time I ever went skiing, I have a new ACL to show for it. And so I think y'all are crazy, (laughs) but you should come out for a visit. We can, we can get you. Yeah. We can get you stable on those two sticks. Yeah. Did I mention that was a green hill that I was doing? (laughs) So I, I, I want to come visit and learn how to cross country ski. That's more my speed. You can't really hurt yourself doing that too, too easily. Right. I'm sure you can in some way, but. Oh, you I think thing. those are skinnier skis. Yeah. Those are. Yeah, but, you're, those... but it's flat though, right? It's flat. And you, I mean, you do go up some hills, sure. like some hills, sure. but it's, it's a fun. It's safer. a lot of work, a lot yeah. of fun, fun exercise. In fact, I like to drop the kids off at ski racing training and then go cross country skiing, get a little time for myself. So you should come do that, Abby. We'd have so much fun. I know. I think we need to do like a girl's trip to Vermont and finish, visit Jenny and do all these cool things. Maybe not going down the hill, Carrie, but maybe maybe we could do that and that'd be fun. I'll I like Vermont in the lunch. summer. <laughs> come in the summer, Susan. You cover the summer. Then we can jump into rivers and yeah. It's Vermont summer cool. is also it's green. Green. It's summer. I have heard you talk about jumping in the lakes in the winter time. And so I'm a little <laughs> suspicious of your activities that you do up there. <laughs> Carrie, I'm going to get you out here. You're going to have, you're going to have an amazing time. I don't think I you can have... jump in the lakes in the winter in Vermont. I'm thinking you'd crack your skull because they're probably frozen solid, aren't they? Not well, you're right. But there, you know, there's a whole group of people that love to do this. They go swimming, you know, once a week, once a month. Out of cold water plunges. I it's it's a little tricky. But these it are the same me... people who put like ice cubes in their baths. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, not for me. <laughs> so, yeah. I'd, I'd like to come visit, but I don't think I'd want to live in Vermont. It's a little chilly for me, I think. <laughs> Y'all ready we for a question it. of the day? Yeah, we I was are. gonna say this is we could probably go on for another I'm half having so much fun, but about... yeah, I guess we I guess we need to get to work and do a question of the day. Just all right. about all of these desert people and warm weather people talking about the silly, silly things that you guys do in Vermont. <laughs> all right. So our question today is, hi, doctors. I'm almost 34, not financially able to freeze eggs or embryos currently, and still about two years away from wanting to get pregnant. I expressed concerns at my GYN appointment six months ago that I thought I had PCOS and she checked a testosterone level. It was normal at 25, but I've read that IUDs can suppress T. Is it possible to diagnose or rule out PCOS while I have a Kylena IUD? And is it worth pursuing more workup later if I have my IUD removed and want to get pregnant? I had an FSH of 8.3 on my day three of my cycle at age 31 on NuvaRing then. Estradiol was not checked. I take CoQ10 um, daily already, and I'm also curious if I need to take um, higher dosages. She was taking 200 milligrams, or if y'all recommend a particular form of CoQ10, um, for example, ubiquinol versus ubiquinone. All right. What do you guys think? I mean, uh, she's worried about PCOS, and she may have it, she may not have it. It doesn't sound like she has it based on what she's saying, but really the bigger issue is what is her egg number, I think. And so one thing I would talk about is having her doctor check her AMH to kind of see how good her ovarian reserve is, because that's probably a little bit better. That'll give her a better idea of how well she'll do with IVF or egg freezing. In terms of the PCOS question, I don't think an IUD would suppress PCOS, Um um, I think certainly her doctor can look at her ovaries, but her testosterone being 25 is kind of low. So I don't think she really fits the bill for that. I, I would say um, just kind of the quick, you know, dirty on PCOS, you got to have two out of three. You have to have either ovaries that appear polycystic. You have to have irregular periods or some signs of hyperandrogenism, whether it's a high testosterone or acne or increased hair growth or something like that. So, you know, you really have to have two of those three. Um, there are things we exclude. You can listen to one of our PCOS podcasts to listen about all of those things. But I do think that an AMH level would be very helpful for you to get an idea of is that number um, on the higher end, in the middle, or on the lower end. Uh, and also, I would not trust an FSH that was drawn while you were using the NuvaRing. That w- that's pretty, um, 
I, I would say that's pretty inaccurate and not probably a, a fair reflection. It, I mean, your FSH level may be fine, but I wouldn't say that just because you had one done on while you're using a NuvaRing that you can trust it. Yeah. And one thing she didn't mention to us is what her cycle was like before she started using birth control. So if she had pretty regular cycles. That indicates that she probably doesn't have PCOS. Yeah. yeah. Any, any other thoughts, ladies? I think you covered the majority of it. I mean, I really do think that some of the prior activity is helpful. AMH would be helpful. It's still not considered diagnostic for PCOS, but if you have a really high one, then it at least gives us more of an idea of what's going on. Um, there can be a little bit of suppression from an IUD. AMH is not quite as rock solid stable as we originally thought it would be where it never, ever changes uh, with response to hormonal medication. But um you know, if you're but, normally at an eight, you're not going to be at a one. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. exactly. It's not going to be that much depression. So, all right. Okay. Very cool. So what we're going to talk about today is something that's um, more near and dear to the heart of third-party reproduction, which is working with not just surrogates, but surrogacy agencies. And I don't know about all you ladies, but I'm, I'm starting to see more people come in where traditionally everybody who had come in looking for a surrogate was uh, typically either a single male, a same-sex male couple, or a typically a heterosexual couple where the woman had had something go on in her life that meant that she was unable to carry a pregnancy, whether that was a hysterectomy, a serious medical condition, what have you. And now I'm noticing that more and more people are coming asking for surrogacy that don't have some of those same indications. It's just, you know, I'm I'm really worried about my ability to handle pregnancy. I'm really worried about some of the more abstract things. So in the process of that journey, most people work with surrogacy agencies. So that's what we're going to focus on today. And um, Jenny, what, what does a surrogacy agency do? Sure. Yeah. So that's a big question. A surrogacy agency... Um, you know, provides a lot of aspects of really helping the intended parent or parent. So whether it be a single male, a male couple, like you said, you know, a heterosexual couple or, a, you know, a female um, in that maybe heterosexual couple or single who has maybe some medical problem that is leading her to not want to not believe that she could safely carry a pregnancy. So these these people might look to an agency to help them match First and foremost, maybe just find a match with a uh, what we call a gestational carrier, um, meaning that this carrier is not biologically related to the baby, but is going to carry that baby for the parent or parents. And that agency, you know, really is going to wrap up everything around the edges. And they, um, you know, they're they're going to sort of pre-certify that carrier for you. So what's typically the very first thing when, when a couple is looking for an agency, what are the things that are important for them to look for? Like when they're on the initial meet and greet interviews, trying to figure out, is this the agency that's right for us? What type of questions are helpful to ask? Sure. So I think, you know, First, I think you want to think about where it's going to be legally and logistically easy for this carrier to deliver your baby, because this is a complex process and you are jumping into, you know, just the beginning of a big project, which may go on for 15 months up to, you know, even a couple of years. And so there are going to be a number of medical aspects that you're going to coordinate. And what you really want is to find a place where that, um, where logistically and legally you can have it as streamlined as possible. Um, and so the agency is going to help you understand those legal aspects, the regulatory components. Um, they're going to help you understand um, other, I don't, Abby, Susan, do you, do you want to jump in? Well, what I was going to ask is, you know, is you'd mentioned that when you look for a surrogacy agency, and you you have to kind of think about the state. First of all, are there states that you know people wouldn't want to have a surrogate in, or is couldn't, it, or couldn't? Is there a location at which the the surrogate 
Does it matter if they're in the same state as you are? Can you have a surrogate (laughs) in a different state than you are? Yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah. Starting with the basics. Well, well, a lot of times it's really, it's great to work with an agency that's working with the clinic that you're, you know, that's known to your clinic because they have a streamlined process. Oftentimes, you know, we have an agency that we work with, you know, probably with 80% of our, of our surrogacy patients. And so that that works really well just because you are coordinating all the medical psychological legal pieces that you know in the same state where you are that's going to for sure streamline the process and then you know where the surrogate is you're close so you can go through the journey with them um they'll deliver in your state but it so but is that but there I, we I don't think... we don't have a lot of surrogacy agencies so for my patients in tennessee or a different state like that How do they, does it matter where they pick the surrogate agency versus the person that's going to carry their pregnancy? Are those the same states or those different states? And does that need to factor in to the decision? Yeah, I think agencies work with with surrogates that they can find in, you know, in various states. And you're they're they're really thinking, I think, legally in terms of the the parentage laws in that state where the surrogate's going to deliver. Um, You know, we're really lucky in Vermont that surrogate. Uh, same third party reproduction was included in in the parentage law. And so that really protects the intended parents at at birth so that the the surrogate or the GC does not, you know, have any um, rights to that child at birth. But I would say that's probably unique though, right? I I, I bet most states are not like that. What do you, Carrie, what, what is it like in Las Vegas? So we work with, it is very common for us to be working with intended parents in one state or different country and a surrogacy agency that's in a, based in another state, a surrogate that's based in a different state and uh, donors, if that's part of the equation in a different state. So it's very common for us to have with every single party involved in a different location. There is a we- there's a website that's actually really helpful, and I'm blanking on the name of it right now, but it looks at surrogacy friendly states, mm. and it's got maps of where the laws are very friendly and where they're very unfriendly. And so most agencies, I would say, pull from a variety of states. They pull surrogates from wherever they can, but there are going to be some states that are really less likely to be pulled from, and that can be based on both the parentage laws. So if somebody has a has a baby as a surrogate or gestational carrier, then, and they decide, Hey, I really like this baby. I want this baby. And they can challenge it in court. And they're more likely to win in those States. The agencies steer clear of those States because they want to make sure that the intended parents are protected for the child that they worked so hard to get, get to. And like Uh, Michigan, I think is one of those States. I remember. Michigan is challenging. Arizona is challenging. Um, A lot of the abortion laws have made things more challenging Mm -hmm. because (laughs) It's not just the abortion itself. It's the potential of what if she has an ectopic pregnancy? And I just went through uh, went through this with one of my patients who's a surrogate where she the journey was already started before all of the abortion laws changed. And so we had to be super, super careful through going through this because even just uh, an incomplete miscarriage where she's bleeding heavily, but there's still a heartbeat. So her mm-hmm. life is in danger, but the child's still alive. Like that's a big deal. And so agencies are very on top of where those laws are favorable and where they are very detrimental to the surrogate involved. And so that map is changing all the time based on what legislation is and is not going through. So what, how do they coordinate, like, how do you do long distance surrogacy when you've got people in all these different places? <laughs> well, we, what we do at our clinic is we, we typically start with, you know, telemedicine. We're so lucky that we're able to have an initial meeting after we've reviewed all of the surrogates medical records from her past deliveries We have a visit with her and or her partner. Um, And I usually actually write on that first visit because that surrogate has been sort of pre-screened and we've already (laughs) accepted her. I also have the intended parents join in on that visit. And we start with telemedicine and we go through the big picture, the surrogate's history, the goals of the intended parents. And we kind of get everything, you know, all out there together as a team for our big picture plan. And then the next step is we do have the surrogate come to the clinic um, for a diagnostic workup. So whether she's out of state or in state, we actually have her come to our clinic. We do a saline sonogram. 
um, to assess just that that cavity is ready for the precious embryo we're about to make and, you know, physical exam, make sure everyone's healthy and we're setting up this baby and the family for success. Um, and so that's going to be the second step. Now, so when you have um, people who are using gestational carriers, who all do you have visit with a counselor to discuss like all the intricacies of more the kind of emotional and psychological components that go into this whole process? Yeah, and all in parallel, right, during the same time. And also via tele, you know, telemedicine Zoom, we can have them meet with a fertility specialized counselor. This is really a conversation to sort of get everyone thinking about all of the, um, you know, what could happen down the line and kind of how, what type of relationship they all want to have and getting everyone on the same page. So we'll have, we'll have that counselor visit with both the uh, gestational carrier alone and with their partner, if they have one, and then also with the intent parents and then one all together so that everyone can just really discuss what this all looks like going forward. So it's not what, a test of anyone. What yeah. kind of work has the agency done before they ever introduce a particular GC to a set of IPs or intended parents? Yeah. Yeah, so mm -hmm. the agencies that we work with have typically done background checks, you know, probably at many levels, including even motor vehicle checks. They've often done home studies or virtual home studies to make sure the home environment's reflective of um, what the gestational carriers reported. They've done a psychological eval, often a personality inventory. Um, they've even taken a deep dive into just the, you know, even maybe the social media life of the gestational oh, yeah. Carrier. I about that. Mm -hmm. What kind of infectious disease testing does the carrier get and does do the intended parents get leading up to that, leading up to the transfer? So every, both, both sides will be, um, you know, we want to, the, the goals here are always to keep everyone safe and follow all the rules. So we're <laughs> following the, the FDA guidelines um, and we're also just optimizing everyone's health. So Everyone is going to be screened both, you know, there's a number of parties here. So just to kind of clarify, you have the, the gestational carrier and then their partner, if they have one, and then the intended parent, and maybe there's two intended parents. So all of those four will be screened within an infectious disease panel. And um, we'll be looking at hepatitis, HIV, syphilis, just making sure that um, gonorrhea, chlamydia, these things, you know, that we're we're not exposing anyone and we're keeping everyone safe. What types of things do you notice that are different between couples that are going through a surrogacy journey with an agency versus couples that are going through on an independent journey where they don't have an agency? What are the differences between those two cycles in terms of what the agency does and does not do? So we, I would say we actually have come to a place where we really all but require an agency because of the, you know, they do so much that is just not as tangible at the beginning of the process that maybe as you're going through, if you're trying to do an independent journey, you reflect back and realize all the work that has to be done. But I would say the biggest thing is communication. I mean, they really guide that communication. They foresee, you know, they sort of can see all the variables, so they can often foresee any bumps that might come up. They, you know, they're there literally when something doesn't go as expected to, and they support both sides. So often the gestational carrier will have a coordinator as well as the intended parent or parents will have a coordinator. And so they're each supported as they go through maybe a difficult, you know, failed transfer or even an early miscarriage they're guiding that communication and keeping it really strong so that everyone can be successful. Now, one big barrier often is kind of the financial implication of using mm -hmm. a gestational carrier. So if somebody's thinking that they may need or want a gestational carrier, what type of dollar signs do they need to think about excluding the IVF cycle itself? Yeah, there are, you know, it's, it's interesting because I think you can almost look now agencies and practices for that matter. Everyone's trying to become more and more transparent with pricing. You know, we don't want, this is already a stressful journey and I think no mm -hmm. one wants surprises, right? So 
I was just recently looking at the Vermont Surrogacy Network's website and noticing that they are very transparent right there with their prices. And, and it, it, um, you know, there are some variables, so I don't think you can give one price for all Just as a parents. relative range. Yeah, maybe I would say it's probably at a minimum going to be 100000 Would you agree with that? And then upwards to one fifty, probably. Yeah. By the time you're all in with everything. And one of the things that it's hard to do is separate out those costs because there's there's a bunch of different places where they come in and different different setups offer different packages for it. And so some people will say, oh, if you pay X price, you're going to get absolutely everything covered. And it's, it's really hard to get absolutely everything covered because you've got the medical fees, the legal fees, the insurance fees, the um, just basic cost of living fees, the agency fees themselves. There's so many different components of this that it's, it really is kind of challenging to get a final number on it. But I, I would say a hundred to 150,000 all in is, is pretty typical and it's going up every day. Cause as, as the cost of insurance in particular increases, and it's not just medical insurance, it's medical insurance for the surrogate. It's medical insurance for the babies. It is life insurance for the surrogate. Insurance. It's all these different things that come together. And so that's one of the reasons why agencies are really helpful because when intended parents think about this journey, they're thinking about, Oh, an agency is just going to find me the physical human being. And that is an important part of what they do, but it's not everything. It's not everything. And, um, the, the people who go through independent journeys, the intended parents tend to realize, oh crap, like there is a lot that goes into this. Even just if they need a, a an extra ultrasound to be coordinated at a high risk center where there's a different set of eyes, skill level, and technology, that can be really hard to get. God forbid something happens where you need an extra layer of stuff. You want an agency there to help grease those wheels and facilitate it because they, this is not the first time they've done it. So I have a question, because in my state, in Tennessee, we don't have probably nearly as many surrogacy cycles as you guys do, or gestational, gestational carrier cycles. And I would say probably 50% are patients where we coordinate and maybe 50% where they choose an agency. And we don't have one particular agency. And I will say my experience over the years with different agencies has been really variable from really good to really bad. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I just wonder for somebody out there that doesn't have the benefit of being in a place where there's a routine agency that the that the center works with, what are the red flags that they should look for when they talk on that telemedicine visit with the agency? What's something that should make them go, okay, no, thanks. I'm going to look for somebody else. I think if they tell you it's going to be easy, if it sounds too good to be true, it might be too good to be true. So, you know, you want someone to spend a lot of time with you and you want them to explain all the ins and outs of this complex process. So you don't, you don't want someone who tries to make it sound shiny and and straightforward you you want someone who's real and can kind of understand you and takes time to get to know you and what your goals are for me one of the biggest things is the agency has to have escrow set up hmm. they can't just say oh yeah you're going to pay us x number of dollars we're going to hold the funds and we'll pay the gc out of that that amount you want protected escrow because the, the places that I have seen cause major drama for the intended parents generally is when it's not an escrow and all of a sudden the agency just vanishes. And that doesn't happen very often, but, um, but one good way to protect yourself about that is escrow because it protects your money. Yeah. At one time we had a patient who was going to be a carrier and she got in her um, intended parent got a bill for removal of her implanted IUD that no one knew about. So those are the kind of things that make me worry about, you know, how, I don't know how as a patient, you would be able to kind of figure that out. Um, that this well, is an you, agency you can that's... probably, yeah, get guidance from your clinic and you for sure would want a reference. I think, you know, a peer reference, a clinic reference. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is are there any good me? are there any good websites that people who are thinking about surrogacy can go to to kind of learn about the process and um maybe gain some of those peer insights? Hmm. That's a great question. <laughs> I hope there are. That would be a good resource. <laughs> so there's a lot of Facebook groups out there. Resolve is out there. Um it's 
some of it is just looking around and finding it. There's not, not a whole lot that are really solidly, absolutely. Oh yes. If you go here, um, a lot of clinics have well-developed websites. Like we have, I know we've got a fair amount of space on our website that's dedicated to it. And one of the the best places for our patients is always like our case managers. No, they've been for the clinics, like, yeah. like Vermont and like Las Vegas, who've been doing this forever and ever. Amen. They've been around long enough to see some things. And so very few places are going to say, no, don't ever go there because <laughs> we don't want to be unprofessional. We don't want to say, don't do this. But if your clinic is saying, we really recommend these three places, there's a reason for that. Mm-hmm. Yep. So it's, Agreed. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think places like the podcast, like actual clinic websites are really helpful. Um, going to some of the circle, uh, circle surrogacy is one place. There's a couple of others that just, they're big developed agencies that can help really iron out. This is what the process is because there's big agencies and there's little agencies, like there's little mom and pop type shops where, or mom and mom type shops. Generally, there's not a whole lot of pops involved, um, but <laughs> there's, there's small independently owned ones. And then there's big commercial ones and they both can be really good. They just provide very different things. It and just depends on what you need and what you feel comfortable with. I mean, just like finding your fertility clinic, do you want to go to a huge institution or something with a couple of yeah. providers and that type of thing? So that yeah. makes sense. You know, there is a fabulous resource for, um, for men having babies, right? So I think, do you all know the men having babies group Mm -hmm. and that's for single men, it's for gay men. They actually host conferences because the process is so complex. It, Uh you know, they spend almost two days going through all aspects of the journey from the egg door to the, to the evaluations and workup to the transfer cycle and I, we've had a lot of patients that have come from that conference and they are so well educated and they have so many peers to talk to about bumps in the road as things come up. It's just, they're really prepared. Yeah. It's not really a question of if there will be bumps in the road, it's what bumps will there be in the road. <laughs> mm-hmm. There's always some. Just- so Jenny, can you speak to like, once you actually have selected your carrier and you're happy with your carrier and you're ready to get going kind of about what's the timeline like at that point? So that's a great step where every everything really starts to move quickly. I think once you've matched and you've been medically cleared, so the gestational carriage done their diagnostic workup cycle, then they're going to go back and you'll do, you know, the intended parents and gestational carrier will do their legal agreement. So mm-hmm. the legal agreements is kind of the final checkoff right before you enter your transfer cycle. And this is, of course, assuming that the embryos have been made and we've we've put in that work ahead of time to make embryos. Um, And so then you move into the transfer cycle. And again, we tend at our clinic to have a big powwow with literally everyone involved, um, which is often four parties because it's two sets of partners often. And, you know, um, we just talk about what the transfer cycle looks like. And that that doesn't take long with the way that we program our cycles um, at this point. You know, it can be three weeks from the gestational carriers period to the date that a transfer happens and another week and a half until you have a pregnancy test. As another, sorry, as another logistic question, do you advise your patients to create embryos and then um, contract with a GC agency or do it all at the same time? What, what's the order of operations that you find the most beneficial? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think, um, you know, it's always been pretty easy to say, make the embryos first and then start looking for the gestational carrier. However, the wait lists have become, I don't know if you've noticed that as well, Carrie, the wait lists have become a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. And it's, it it depends a little bit with the agency, whether they will will let you enter the matching process with a carrier. Mm -hmm. Um, Sometimes they require you to have your embryos made just to start that process since there are so many Mm -hmm. parents waiting for a carrier. Yeah. And I've had a couple of people actually say that they wanted to, some of them went through a couple of cycles to create several embryos because the agencies told them that the carrier may not pick them if they didn't have at least a couple of embryos. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. 
Yeah. And single embryo transfer is another big one. Like there are agencies that won't even take IPs unless they say we're doing a single embryo transfer. Mm -hmm. and there's a lot of GCs that say, I will only do a single embryo transfer mm -hmm. because as GCs get more and more educated and they realize, oh, doing a double embryo transfer and carrying twins is riskier. I don't want to do that. It, that starts to play a role too. And mm -hmm. I think the longest part of all this is getting the medical screening for the GC because, and in the initial match, because even just getting records on a GC for that records review can take months, depending on where she's coming from. And, and there are a couple places in particular where if you hear, oh, records are originating in X type of facility, you're like, okay, this is going to be three months before we see these records. And it just, it is what it is, but Parents need to know that that initial stage of getting through the medical clearance can potentially take a long time because the match takes a long time because getting the records takes a long time. I would say going, Jenny, I would think going through an agency, they would have a lot of those records already there. So if you're going through an agency, that's going to go by maybe a little bit faster than if you're choosing your own GC from mm -hmm. whatever um, source. One other point I always make to, um, to intended parents, uh, particularly in the state of Tennessee, because I don't think our laws are quite as good as the laws in Vermont. <laughs> and so I always make a point that if you have a carrier that's in a different state, you're going to, we're going to have to find an attorney in that state to write the contract because it depends on the state, well, the state in, in which the baby's born. So presumably if a woman lives in a different state than you, that's probably where she's going to have the baby. And that's where the contract needs to be written. Agree. Any other points about surrogacy agencies in particular that we need to be thinking about, Jenny, that we haven't covered so far? You know, I think they've just really grown. And they're, I, you know, when I was starting, say, 10 ish years ago, I guess at this point, the agencies were more ancillary. And now they are such a core part of the process. I mean, we work so tightly together. And they are so good at their jobs. I mean, it's really fun when you have a team that you can all work together with to accomplish this goal. I would totally agree with that. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Jenny. We are very appreciative of your expertise and of also hearing about the crazy things that uh, you Vermont <laughs> Vermonters, uh, Vermont people um, do. And so... <laughs> Thank you so much for coming to talk with us about surrogacy and agencies today. And to our audience, be sure to tune in next week for more. Thanks so much for listening this week. Be sure to subscribe, leave us a review in Apple Podcasts. We would love to hear from you. We're on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. So hop on by and leave us a like and a follow and say hello. You can also- Thanks so much for having me. Have oh, great. <laughs> you can also visit us on fertility.com uncensored.com for specific questions. All questions will be answered on our podcast for the Ask the Doc segment. We'd love to hear episode ideas. Um, so tell us what you're thinking. As always, this podcast is intended for entertainment and it's not a substitute for medical advice from your own physician. All right. We'll see you all soon. Bye. Bye. Bye.